News of the Times. Serial Killer Saturdays. The Eightfold Murderer. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, it is 1925 in a small village in Germany where an isolated villa becomes the scene of a bloodbath. Fritz Angerstein is a man on the edge. With mounting financial debts, Angerstein has begun embezzling funds from his company where he has just been caught. His beloved wife is dying slowly and painfully. His mother-in-law, with whom he has a contentious relationship, lives in the house with them. All of these events are happening simultaneously, and one day, Angerstein snaps. We look at the events leading up to the bloodbath in the small village in Westphalia, in Germany, leading to the eightfold murder in today's episode of Serial Killer Saturdays. We hope you enjoy the show. Background Fritz Heinrich Angerstein was born in 1891 to a respectable middle-class family. Angerstein was one of ten children and seems to have had a lifetime history of various physical ailments, including tuberculosis and severe painful headaches. He was a delicate child. In 1911, Angerstein married. The couple remained childless as they suffered through six miscarriages. By all accounts, the marriage was a happy one, and he was noted as being a loving and doting husband to his delicate wife. Kath's ill health progressed, and she remained mostly bedridden. In 1921, it seems to have been the start of a downward spiral for Angerstein. In his role as manager of a limestone mine in a smallish village, he was given a large house with enough space to lodge himself and his wife, his mother-in-law, and work office for company staff and room for personal staff. The relationship between himself and his mother-in-law was not a pleasant one. Despite this, he continued to support his wife as she grew weaker with bouts of vomiting and ongoing digestive issues. In the same year as they moved into their new large villa provided by the company, Cathy wrote Angerstein a letter stating she was unable to be the wife that he wanted due to her illness. According to Angerstein, the two discussed a suicide pact. Simultaneously, Angerstein was undergoing financial difficulties which had led him to embezzle money from his company. The embezzlement of some 14,000 German marks was discovered by a colleague who reported the large deficit discrepancy to the manager. A few days later, the manager confronted Angerstein with his alleged deception and fraud. Simultaneously, Angerstein discovered and read his wife's diary, where she speaks of her last wishes as she is sure she will soon die. From the Halifax Evening Courier, the 2nd of December, 1924, terrible crime in Westphalia, eight murdered. A band of 25 robbers last night committed a terrible murder at Saigon in Westphalia. They attacked the house of a director of a limestone quarry for the purpose of robbing him of a sum of money which he kept there for the payment of wages. The occupants offered resistance, but they were all shot down by the robbers, who, after searching the house, set fire to it and decamped. When the police arrived on this scene, they found the director severely wounded and wife, mother-in-law and six other occupants of the house dead. Angerstein states that the bloody scene filmed with dead bodies was due to an attack from robbers who knew 
that he kept the company payroll in his house. Angerstein gives a convincing display of sorrow and shock, along with several wounds to his body. The local police initially believe him. From the Barclay Daily Gazette, the 2nd of December, 1924, Bandits Invade German Village. Bandits murdered seven persons at a lonely village near Sagan today. They burned one to death and fatally wounded the owner of the villa, a quarry director named Angerstein, when he arrived on the scene of the carnage. They fled into nearby woods without the money they had come to obtain, and posses are now in search for them. The bandits, 25 in number, arrived at Angerstein's villa during his absence. He returned this afternoon and heard sounds of fighting in his own home. As he entered, two men stopped him, stabbed him repeatedly, and left him for dead, lying before the garden gate. The bandits then killed Mrs. Angerstein, his mother-in-law, and a woman neighbour. Four servants who attempted to resist the slaughter were chopped down. One girl servant fled into her room and locked herself in. The bandits made no attempt to break in, but set fire to the house, burning her alive, and incinerating the remaining bodies beyond recognition. Angerstein's five-year-old daughter is missing and may have been carried away by the bandits. The hills are scoured for the missing five-years-old girl and the 25 bandits described by Angerstein. The details of how each murder takes place is found as the police investigate the crime scene forensically. From the Cheltenham Chronicle on the 6th of December 1924, Household Wiped Out, Eight People Murdered by a German Gang, A Gruesome Mystery. A crime as mysterious as it is ferocious and sanguinary has raised suddenly into odious prominence the little township of Sega, which lies on the wooded hilly banks of the Dill, about 50 miles north of Wiesbaden. The details of this ghastly drama, says the Benin correspondent of the Delhi Telegraph, will probably never be cleared up as all eight persons who could have thrown any light upon have perished. Not far from Sega Station, which appears to be detached from the town, stands the villa of a man named Angerstein, who is manager of a limestone quarry. The house seems to stand high above the railway line and in some degree isolated, although it does not actually lie in the midst of the woods which cover the surrounding hills. Following his usual custom, Angerstein, Monday evening between six and seven, walked into the town to post letters. As he was nearing the villa on his return, he heard from the direction of the house the sounds of terrified voices and cries for help. Quickening his pace, he was just about to enter the garden when two men darted out on him from the bushes and plunged daggers into his body. These weapons, obviously directed at the heart, missed their aim, but Angerstein is so seriously injured that he is hardly expected to recover. His assailants appear either to have believed him to be dead or to have been alarmed by other persons. In any case, the injured man was able to drag himself far enough to reach, with his own cries for assistance, the inmates of another villa which stands at no great distance from his own. The owner of this house, hearing what had happened, mustered a small band of railwaymen and others and hastened to Angelstein's villa. By this time, flames and smoke were pouring from the roof. The interior of the house resembled a shambles. In the lower story 
were first encountered the bodies of two gardeners who had evidently hurried to the house on hearing screams thence. Like all the other victims of the tragedy, they had been killed with axes, hatchets or knives. One of the rooms on the ground floor was used as an office for the quarrying company and two clerks employed there had also been killed. In the kitchen lay the body of Ang Angerstein's mother-in-law, with her head completely severed by a blow from an axe. His sister-in-law, who was staying with them, was found dead in the bathroom, where she had apparently hoped to find a secure refuge. Frau Angerstein, who had been ill in bed, was lying on the floor in her room with eighteen wounds to her body. When the fire had been extinguished, the remains of the servant girl were found in the garret, but so much disfigured by flames that it was impossible to say whether or not she had been deliberately murdered. The fire, which did much damage to the upper part of the house, appears to have originated in an attempt to burn the murdered person. Their bodies had been drenched with benzene, and it is believed the murderers must have conveyed it to the house by car. Before attacking the house, the murderers had taken the precaution of cutting both the telephone wires and the mains water. In this way, they obviously hoped to prevent appeals for help from reaching the town and to render in vain the attempts of the fire brigade to save the house from the flames. In most of the accounts of the grim drama published, it is conjectured that the object of the attack on the villa was to steal the safe in which the money for the payment of the quarryman's wages was kept. In point of fact, however, this receptacle was not interfered with at all, nor is there any evidence up to the present of other articles being stolen from the house. A singular feature of the crime is that Angerstein's daughter is missing. She is variously described as being twelve and five years old. It is so specifically stated in the report that a search in those portions of the building which had been burnt out revealed no trace of her. The suggestion is also put forward that she may have been abducted by the murderers. If this is so, the crime becomes more mysterious than ever. Emphasis has been laid upon the general popularity of Angerstein, excluding the possibility of the crime being an act of revenge. From the manner in which the raid was carried out, it assumed that between ten and twenty men must have taken part in it. Naturally, the vigorous efforts. Emphasis has been laid upon the general popularity of Angerstein, excluding the possibility of the crime being an act of revenge. From the manner in which the raid was carried out, it assumed that between ten and twenty men must have taken part in it. Naturally, vigorous efforts are made to trace the criminals. These are believed to have dispersed into the woods, and attempts are being made to hunt them down with trained police dogs. All the railway stations in the neighbourhood have been put under supervision, so that it would be difficult for strangers to get away by rail. Meanwhile, all the country round is being scoured by gendarmerie. This horrific crime brings in the city police who, as they begin to dig, start to find holes with the story almost immediately. From the Sheffield Daily Telegraph, the 5th of December 1924, Westphalian tragedy, how suspicion fell on Angerstein, the latest development in the affair of the terrible tragedy at Sega, Westphalia, in which a man named Fritz Angerstein is accused of murdering successively his mother-in-law, his daughter, his wife, servant, three clerks, 
a gardener and a workman is, says Reuters correspondent, a statement made by an official of well-known firm of ironmongers accusing Angerstein of having committed frauds on a large scale which only came to light on the day of the crime. It appears that suspicion first fell on Angerstein in connection with the tragedy owing to the fact that he donned his overcoat after inflicting the wounds on himself. The contents of the safe in the house were also found to be intact. Angerstein is described as a very kind and modest man. The embezzlement and fraud stories come out along with the difficult relationship he had with his mother-in-law. The initial inquest finds Angerstein the most probable murderer, and he is arrested. It doesn't take long for Angerstein to confess his crimes. The prosecution charges 13 crimes to his door. The eight murders, two charges of embezzlement, arson, perjury from his initial statements of 25 robbers, and forging documents. From the Irish Weekly and Ulster Examiner, the 11th of July, 1925, Slayer of Eight, the German mass murderer on his trial, a shocking story. The trial has begun in the small town of Limbunten, Lahn, today, in a packed court, of the murderer Angerstein, who last December killed his wife, mother-in-law, and the latter's sister, one maidservant, two office assistants, and two gardener's boys, eight in all. He was quite calm and collected during the trial today, and seemed more concerned with the fact that he was defrauding his employers rather than that of an eightfold murderer. Angerstein found a huntsman's dagger and stabbed his wife with it while she was in bed. He then went into the cellar intending to commit suicide. He found an axe there and heard his stepmother scream at the sight of her murdered daughter, whereupon he dashed upstairs in a furious rage and stretched her dead with blows of the axe, nearly severing her head. The maidservant was a witness of the murder of the mother-in-law and Angerstein chased her through the rooms as she fled screaming for help and killed her also with the axe. He then fell asleep on a couch in a room below and was awakened by the gardener's boy who wished to have coffee. He took him upstairs for this purpose and there saw the bodies and the axe and it was only then that he realised what had happened during the night, for he had completely forgotten everything. He again seized the axe and struck the boy down, and while doing so, also axed the office assistant. Dittmann, another office assistant, arrived, whom he also promptly killed with the same weapon. But though the prosecuting counsel denounced him as a deliberate criminal of the worst type, and a systematic, hardened hypocrite, his case will present to many less biased minds a most baffling psychological problem. Almost all the witnesses as to his character spoke of him in the highest possible terms. He passed in the neighbourhood as a courteous, kindly, religious man of irreproachable life. His marriage was described as happy and harmonious. Many friends of the family declared that he appeared to be a most affectionate husband and invariably treated his constantly ailing and rather capricious wife with seducious tenderness and consideration, striving to gratify her every whim. His sister-in-law, whom he killed, told her friends that he had been like a second father to her. To those under him, he was a generous, indulgent master. Until his defalcations were discovered, his employers regarded him as a hard-working, conscientious, precise servant 
almost the only exception to the general chorus of praise of his past was the doctor, who had attended his wife and, for some reason, looked on him with suspicion, but whose evidence seemed to be coloured by prejudice. The medical doctors under whose observation Angerstein was placed pronounced him perfectly sane and responsible for his actions. In his ancestry there were no indications of insanity. He said that once he and his wife agreed to commit suicide together and were actually up to their necks in a pond when a snatch of song sung in the distance brought them to their senses. Angerstein has a robust defence team who argue that the murders were not premeditated, but rather a temporary madness brought on by the suffering he was witnessing of his beloved wife, claiming the other seven murders to be incidental and requesting a verdict of manslaughter. The defence is fundamentally flawed, as Angerstein had taken the precaution of cutting the phone lines and water supply before he began the mass executions. From the Northern Whig, the 14th of July, 1925, eight-fold death sentence passed in Berlin. The counsel for the defence in the trial of the German mass murderer Angerstein maintained that the crimes were not premeditated, otherwise he would have acted quite differently. They argued that he committed the first murder in a sudden fit of madness at the sight of the suffering of his wife, and that the subsequent murders were the result of unfortunate coincidence for which there was an explanation. They therefore pleaded that Angerstein was not guilty in the sense of the indictment, and should the bench accept the defence's view then Angerstein was not guilty of more than manslaughter. This plea not accepted, and Angerstein was found guilty and sentenced to death eight times over for the eight murders. He was also deprived of his civil rights for life. The accused received the sentence with a composed but downcast air, and declared that he recognised that his deeds could only be expatiated by his life, the accused having waived his right to appeal, the sentence will stand. Angerstein was executed on the 17th of November 1925 by decapitation with an axe. Postscript. The case is still remembered today. One of the questionable features of the prosecution team at the time was the relatively new technology of optogram. With the advent of photography, it was believed in some circles that, like a camera, the eye could take a picture of the last thing it saw before life expired. It was presented in court that a picture of Angerstein could be seen as well as a picture of Angerstein wielding a hatchet could be seen reflected in the eyes of two of Angerstein's victims. This is one of the few legal cases anywhere where optogram technology was presented as evidence in a court of law. That concludes this episode of Serial Killer Saturdays, The Eight-Fold Murderer. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, we will be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our little channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful where we look at crimes in a location, such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, 
where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. And Sundays is a bit of fun with the unique mini murder mystery where you, the listener, have a chance to solve a murderous riddle. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.